I wanted to talk just quickly about complexity. This busts people's brains, but it's important. And it's, it's just that we get stuck thinking that there is one answer. And we want someone to tell us the one answer, and there is no one answer. And this is this whole idea, if the evidence supports conflicting hypothesis, it's probably complex. So you'll hear a lot of information, and some of it will be contradictory. I was trained by Alan Savory in uh, the mid-90s. I uh, started doing some mucking around with grazing management, sort of uh, late 80s, early 90s and stuff. But this is from the Cognitive Edge, and it's a guy called Dave Snowden. And if you get to watch some of his, if that doesn't bust your brain, I don't know. But it helps us to understand what's going on. That if, if it's obvious, if it's really tightly constrained, you can have best practice. So best practice grazing management is an oxymoron. It does not work. So if it's complicated, so that might be like, you know, Christine's managing the, uh, the theatre up at uh, Armadale sort of thing. It's sort of tightly constrained. People are controlled in and out. They count the tools in and out so that they don't leave too much inside us. So that's that sort of, and you can have best practice. Good practice is more like planting a crop where you'd go and get an agronomist and advice. So you can actually get advice. It's still tightly constrained and you can get good practice and there's more than one answer. What we're dealing with when we're farming, we throw in people and relationships and other family members and stuff, we're talking about complexity. The best way I've found to think about this is that the definition of insanity does not apply in the complex arena. You can do exactly the same thing and get a different answer. And it's almost impossible to do exactly the same thing. So that's what I have to reflect on to sort of get my head into that thinking about this. You can try and impact that pasture, graze it exactly the same way as you did last year, and it will not be the same, and it will not behave the same. So just, that was just quickly if uh, you were interested in that. Just some of the money. Um, you know, I often get a flogging. You know, I come from Hamilton. It's like the home of high input agriculture. We've got the long-term phosphate trial. You know, the consultants are thick on the ground down there. You know, and, um, I won't say what they say about them and what they say about me. This is in Canada, and it's much easier, it seems. It's a bit like managing someone else's farm. It's easier to think about Canada than Australia. This is income, farm income, and this is farmer's income. You know, they're not linked. They're not coupled. There is no link between production and profit. Everything, I had a stint at uh, the DPI, and I was going to give it a flogging, but I might not, because people probably work there in, New South, uh, in South Australia. But um, we always talked about that, and I'd be arguing about profit, they'd be telling me, Graham, it's about production. So it was really about that. We're doing some work uh, with Stiper up at Narrabri, with Sydney Uni, on using native grass seed for for flour or you know, seed for grain idea, you know, the Bruce Pascoe dark, dark emu. And they keep saying that these are linked, we just need to get this going up faster. This is going down faster as that goes up faster. So, but the point I'm trying to make is that in this period, 85 to 16, 98% of farmers' income, gross income, um, went to agribusiness and banks. And I go, gee, that's clever, isn't it? I hadn't realised how good these people were. I had the inklings, because I had a mate that ran the Highford Agency out of Portland, and he said, who's your neighbour? And I said, oh, Mook Vaughan. And he goes, oh, Mook, he's a kip. And I'm going, kip? And a key important person. If they get him to change, they get everyone. Mook, when Mook cuts his hay, this is down near Hayward, and everyone cuts their hay. So I thought, oh God, we're going around going, oh, 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 and these people are out there marketing to us. But this is the clever bit. They've left Canadian taxpayers to backfill the incomes, which is basically uh, the profit of the agribusiness, by $100 billion, and the farmers have borrowed another $100 billion. So I, I wanted to write to Barnaby and just say, look, well, if he gets back in, um, <laughs> I, I think you need to give the money straight to agribusiness rather than passing it through the farmers <laughs> because it's very wasteful and there's going to be losses. Yeah? Just by passing it through, there's going to be losses. So, but I'm not sure how profitable that would be and how good. This is Australia. So the green line's gross farm 
2014 figures, and that's the net farm. It doesn't have debt in it, these figures. Um, this is by Ben Rees, um, Agriculture, the real story. And I've been saying that debt became self-aware around about 2003. But um, not everyone's seen the Terminator movies. So, but yeah, like what I'm saying is this is out of control. When we've tried to look at what's happening now, how come this is flattened? They believe the foreclosures are starting to match the borrowings. So it's flattened. So when people say to me, I have to spray or I have to do this or I have to do that to make a profit, I go, no, you do not. There is no evidence. And then they go, I do better than those figures, Graham. And I go, yes, you're right. They're averages. So if you're doing better, someone else is doing worse. So we need to be very, very aware and very, very frightened of advice. And I also say, especially advice from a little fella from Southwest Victoria. So we need to go out and work out. So this is moving to somewhere, but this is um, a guy I'm working with, uh, Doug McKenzie Moore, and he does this uh, community-based social marketing. I go, you, you know, it's not really a name that markets well, but you know, and what I do, do with people, and I won't do it, but I ask farmers, are you mates with your fertilizer salesman? And it's a bit harsh on people, so I've had to drop it off because I thought I was really clever, but it breaks their hearts. And they go, yeah, he's a really nice guy. I go, does he ring you up you know, when the ship's held up or the price is going up or, you know, or the, yeah, there might be a shortage? Yep, yep. So I get them nodding. And then I go, oh, that's called prompting. That's a marketing technique. So your mate's ripping you off, basically. And when you look at just spreading fertiliser, they've made it a social norm. They provide incentives. They run things to get you committed. They get you to agree to buy. So uh, almost like public commitments. So this is the social pressure, again, the norms. Uh, I've got there about sort of what happened at home and stuff. Um, lack of knowledge, they read the soil test for you, they provide all of that for you, and then at home, and I'm sure it's probably the same in South Australia, they'll come and spread it for you. So they handle convenience, all the structural barriers, if you forget to act, all the motivation, all the social pressure. That is how they get 98% of the total income. It's not a pretty picture. So I, I just thought I'd say it. I've been working with Tim Hutchings. He did his PhD as his um, farm succession planning uh, up at uh, CSU. And uh, farm viability depends more on minimising the losses than maximising the production. It is not the advice we get. When Cole talks about that, if you lower your risk, you actually do this. It's the risk. You know, in New South Wales, DPI in New South Wales has published that dual purpose sheep are making more money than cropping, yet everyone's getting out of sheep and going to cropping. So over time, so over that decade, you need to know that it's actually, you've got to have more money in the bank at the end of the decade. Tim Hutchings, and he's conventional, he worked for Mike Stevens and Associates, um, he said to me, for that sort of sheep cropping sort of property, if you live long enough, you will go broke. <laughs> and I go, wow, oh, this is from someone that sort of is a fan of this stuff. So, yeah, so um, this is dairy work that um, they did this idea. The guy was uh, leasing off um, uh, the next door property. You know, did it make business sense to milk off that as well, expand the dairy herd, or did it make sense to get rid of the lease property, you know, or did it make sense to stay where they were? And, it, and the key point for me was irrespective of the change you know, of getting a bigger herd, it had to reduce stocking rate. We're chronically overstocked to the point that in southwest Victoria, out of the 15 DSC a hectare we're carrying with that southwest monitor farm project, six of those go on feeding and pasture cops, fertiliser, resowing, all those sort of things. I can carry 10 DSC with no inputs. So I can actually, at lower risk, because I, the risks go, and this is Tim Hutchings work, it goes debt, rainfall, market price. That's the order of risks in a business. So lower stocking rate ex reduces your exposure to rainfall risk and you keep more money over time. So we need to be really aware. So be afraid, be very afraid. I'll just quickly, yeah, three ways, and Cold sort of did this in his much nicer way, that you know, number one, decrease your overheads. Number two, improve your gross margin. 
A friend of mine, Mark Gardner, that works out of Dubbo, hub of the West, as he'd have to say, um, he's got people now that are getting $90 gross margin per DSC. So the Southwest Monitor Farm project, yeah, like we think we're the centre of the universe down in southwest Victoria. Um, I find the Gippslanders don't actually think it's part of Australia, but we um, that uh, improving gross margin, so we're doing about $25 gross margin per day in DSE in southwest Victoria. He's getting 90 for people by doing individual animal ID and adjusting all those things. And then, if you get the land that healthy that it's actually constantly providing low risk, more feed, then you increase turnover because that's the one that increases your risk. These two decrease your risks. Um, just quickly on some land stuff, and you're probably getting sick of it. You know, we think of erosion like this, you know, down our way, we're pretty good at it. Um, like we think we are in South West Victoria. Um, but most of the erosion is from water, damage hitting bare ground. You know, uh, my boss at the DPI, um, when I, Mark Gardner calls it my sabbatical. <laughs> so I go, oh, hardly fair, I thought I was working. And um, he said that that bit of soil in there that gets splattered lands over here and then a raindrop hits there and goes back and there's no net erosion. And he's a soil scientist. I go, wow. Really, Dicko? <laughs> and uh, just to highlight, this is a little waterfall out of land we were managing. Um, we were uh, leasing a board off timber core, and just before they went racks up, they, want, they gave us 30 days to get enough money together. I couldn't get the money together, and uh, we checked it, and it didn't make sense. But this is what it looks like. This is in uh, November, um, and you know, that's liquid topsoil. That's liquid nutrient. It's liquid seed, it's everything that you want to keep. I also then do this thing about we don't have OH&S in southwest Victoria. So this, is, this is a floating floating raft of reeds. You can imagine how much water's coming over here. And then I do this one, I go, at least I got to keep Tommy, he's my favourite. So <laughs> goes well for the mothers and stuff, that one I found. Um, but it still happens, happens every time we get a runoff event. It does not get any better, the ground cover in November in southwest Victoria. Early November November, it's green, it's vibrant, it's growing, and this is what happens every time we get a runoff event. When it's like this, we can clean it up. This is water coming into our place, water coming out, into the waterfall, water coming out. I argue that everyone needs to do this. If you are not part of the problem, you must clean it up. The quickest, simplest, easiest way of checking whether you're any good at land management is to take a jar of water coming in, the jar of water going out, and take a photo of it and record the date and what time and all those things. But most of our cameras and stuff, phones do that now. Because it actually is, but the trouble is there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide here. This is harsh on people. We think we're doing a good job, we need to support it by evidence. Um, do you know the... Uh, the CMA sent down someone to see if I'd filled the jar up from the tap. And I go, oh, we live in a high trust environment. <laughs> but, yeah, but this is in 0607, we had the 0607 drought, so it broke for us on the 20th there of January. And this is water coming out at the bottom of our place that we were managing. There's our cows there and flowing across the land and down the creek and it was clear coming out of our place at the end of the drought. We found another grass. We got red grass during the drought because we opened it up a bit. And uh, so I went into work and said, oh, we've got a new species. It's a great day. Yeah, I'm celebrating. And so they said, um, Graham, what was it? I said, oh, yeah. I go, red grass. And they go, oh, what's the palatability of that? So me being me said, a lot higher than dirt. Because <laughs> that was what they had. That was all their little farms, all the research plots. They destocked the long-term phosphate trial. It wasn't published anywhere. I wanted to say, do you want me to write the press release? You know? <laughs> you had Graham Hand speaking, Museum of Agriculture. <laughs> no one ever chipped me. <laughs> like, so, um, this is a great slide. This is Death by PowerPoint. So this is this landscape function, David Tongway and Norm Hindley. If you want the land not to be eroding, to infiltrate water and cycle nutrients, this is what you've got to measure. If you want to predict these or estimate these, this is blue ribbon peer-reviewed double overhead foxtail science. This is as good as it gets. The World Bank goes and gets David Tongway and we don't even know who he is in Australia. So uh, when they 
you know, lit up the oil wells on the way out after that first Gulf War, they went and got David Tongway to estimate the damage. So a lot of this was out at, he developed it, Norman uh, David uh, developed it out at Cobar and stuff. So, but if you want stability, you need soil cover. I don't know anyone that doesn't know that. There might be some, because like we do a fair bit of bare ground around us at home, but the other thing I was thinking about the insect attack, the neighbours neighbor said to me, the only reason we didn't have insect attack because he was killing them all for me. And I'm going, ecology, reverse ecology. So um, what people don't know though, if you want nutrient cycling and you want infiltration, and you're probably onto this, it's the basal area or the bases of the perennial grass. So you know, Christine's liquid carbon pathway provides the nutrient cycling through those. They're like great big funnels for water and air and everything, pumping sugars, the whole thing. So people don't like that down our way. We'd rather have chicory plantain or loosen and make sure we destroy the landscape. But yeah, so we need to know that it's predominantly got to be the basal area, big basal areas, and then you need litter between the perennial grasses in the intertussic space, but it's the degree of decomposition that drives your nutrient cycling. So you've got nutrient cycling coming from the liquid carbon pathway and the short-term, short-lived carbon cycle that Christine was talking about to get you that nutrient cycling. So if you create those conditions of big perennial grass spaces and decomposing litter in the intertussic space, you will increase available phosphorus. We have not seen this. We've done this research with Sydney University. We've done it with everyone. It's impossible not to increase available phosphorus. Some of these cryptogam moss and lichen, they give a little bit of stability, a bit of nutrient cycling, and these other things down here. But, you know, is there crust? How rough is the surface has a big impact on nutrient cycling. A bit of roughness across the surface holds up a lot of things and helps nutrient cycles. Yeah, how springy it is, all that sort of stuff. So, um, I'm going like a rocket. Um, the, um, we need a goal to manage thwarts. You know, like a lot of Alan's stuff, his model's the only practical way I know of handling complexity. And we need to, this is ours. So this, a dense perennial grassland with deep stable litter, increasing mature perennial grass plants and more than 30 perennial grass species. This is research we did for the action on the ground. Stiper had a project on 13 farms, six in Victoria, seven in New South Wales. This one was near Braidwood. This, this, is the, uh, this is the treatment, this is control, and this is after two years of changed management. This one started much worse than that one, but I couldn't work out how to do this without too many slides. But this one is like that, and this one is like, and two years. And this is just based on what uh, the way we've been now training people. So what I'm talking about is rapid, rapid improvement in soil health. This is uh, what that, some of that decomposing litter. This is a slide. We were up in uh, central Queensland doing cover cropping and consulting crop, Cole and I, last week, and decomposing litter in that intertussic. And I've got some more examples up further. So one of the things is we have a definition of perennial grass recovery. So it's not for everyone. I've been trying to get Alan to like it, and I find that's pretty tricky with Alan Savory. The, um, he really liked it the first time I presented it to him at Dubbo. He said it was a valuable addition. The next time, oh, no, I don't like it. Okay, oh, <laughs> so I, yeah, sort of thought I was sort of pretty good and then went back to normal. So, so our definition is a perennial grass is recovered when it looks like an ungrazed plant and contains fresh yellow litter. If you've got to build litter and get decomposing litter on the soil surface, you've got to grow it. It doesn't come, like it doesn't come from nowhere. And that's, that's about leaf emergence rate. So everyone familiar with leaf emergence rate, grass plant physiology? They, they'll, they'll, as, after they've been grazed really flat, they'll start to emerge and you'll get, so if I think of perennial ryegrass, you'll get one leaf, two leaf, three leaf. For the fourth to emerge, the, the oldest one then becomes litter. So it looks like an ungrazed plant because all those chewed off tips now are in the litter base. 
they're no longer sticking up. So that's about no chewed off tips and a, a nice green colour. And the fresh yellow litter means it's from the last time it was grazed rather than last spring or a couple of years ago. You know that really, <laughs> I was going to say dirty, rotten old grey litter. When it's grey, it's oxidising and the carbon's going up into the air. We're looking for that fresh litter. It feeds the soil. This is uh, work done by uh, Sue Orgel from DPI New South Wales. And she found that uh, in terms of increasing soil health, you have annual litter, annual plants, perennial litter, perennial grasses. So they're all grasses. So yeah, so annual grass litter, annual grasses, perennial grass litter, perennial grass plants. So, and that depends on temperature and soil moisture. If the soil becomes more fertile, it actually grows broader leaves rather than changing too much that rate of emergence. And that's driven by temperature and soil moisture. If you want a lower risk, what we say is you need to make sure you've linked up enough rainfall and growing events to, to make sure that you've got the grass recovered. And I've tried to put that in as a slide on there. Um, this is a slide out of Alan's book, and I've just crossed out the dates. Other times. Uh, I, I have a problem that we should never ever, in a complex system, give times. So I'll get Cole to change his three to four months to question mark. But what I'm going to get to is, this is the way we do with grazing. So it's ready, a mature plant ready to be grazed and it contains fresh litter. They come in their severe grazes. Uh, our, all our sheep and cattle tend to, and horses tend to be severe grazers. We push the litter onto the ground and freshen that plant up. It then moves its root reserves, so it will carbohydrates around and starts putting up fresh litter. If the animals come back now, the plants are pretty toxic. That's where you can get a lot of metabolic diseases if you come back at this stage when it's too young. And the other one, the dairy farmers and stuff will talk about the cows are pulling the grass out of the ground because the roots haven't recovered from the previous grazing. It then starts to look like a fresh plant and get that. And then when it's got fresh litter and full root reserves, I'm saying that's the cycle we go through when we're grazing. So from there to there's quite a long time for us. So, um, and then assume the grazing has been severe because some plants are always grazed. For the highest palatable, most but yeah, best high succession, best grass sort of in that paddock. It gets a severe graze. This is another one out of Alan's book. This is that, the horse has only been in there for an hour, but it's eaten that plant right down. So the problem, and um, you know, uh, Andre Voisin, you know, grass productivity, and um, Johann Zietman, um, I can't remember the name, it's a uh, uh, cattle veld, no, I can't get it. Um, but they, they all talk about that the problem is that cows select what they like rather than mow to a certain height. Johan's a bit funny. He said, when we train them to mow to a certain height, then we'll be able to just take off as much as we want. So if they, uh, my thinking is, and I'm happy that I'm wrong, and it's a different hypothesis to a lot of other people, is that if they're going to selectively graze that grass, then they may as well take a lot of them down. So we're in the slow rotation, high utilisation. There is some research from USDA showing that that increased the grasses and things like that, but that's the way we do it. This is um, maybe some evidence. This is what we took over and Christine and Colin came. I was glad Chris was here today, actually. Then Colin picks on her and not me. The, um, but I go, it was a monoculture of uh, Cape weed. And then I go, oh no, I lie, there was some thistles. There was some thistles. But there was also some Yorkshire fog grass in amongst it. We didn't re sow, we didn't spray, we just grazed from there. What it was, we'd overborrowed. We'd done the unusual thing of buying something that we actually couldn't afford. <laughs> and we had no money and we only had a few cows. So the weak link in our business was cows, not feed. So we just grazed this back. So we'd had a smaller place and then we'd got a bigger place. So I uh, went and got them off adjustment and um, while they were on adjustment, I vaccinated, I drenched, I did everything because I was not in control of them. So just want to be clear about that. And Susie wasn't into letting, um, not vaccinating the kids because she wasn't waiting for natural selection to kick in. So the, um, <laughs> which can cause some stress. So, but that's just using grazing only. 
no fertiliser, no herbicide, no inputs, we put it back to grass over time. When I did the numbers at the time, I, could, I was going to start minus 400 a hectare. The first year we made 25. I, I've forgotten where the question came through from, you know, about the cost or something or... Um, when we regenerated this, just through grazing, re-sowing never ever caught up. We were always in front. So we didn't increase our borrowings, number one risk, and we had very low rainfall risk while we were doing it. I've worked a lot on doing sort of the payback period on pasture re-sowing and stuff, and the MLA did work, and uh, Nigel McGuckey and out of bed, and you go, did a thing on it. Um, the rules of the game, the rules of squatter had changed, he wrote this paper. And they, MLA believed that if the farmers knew how much better it was to re-sow that more would do it. And actually what they found is when they told them and it was a seven to nine year payback period and it assumed average rainfall, average prices and a 50% increase in, in production, which is the basis of that re-sowing model, the less they did it. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Sort of like if you're going to take that for a bet when you, you know, we're always getting average rainfall and average prices. Yeah, so. so this causes a lot of stress, and I'll talk about it more with people if they want afterwards, but all we did was, under that cape weed, it was shiny, yeah? It was like a smooth cap surface, so we weren't eating the cape weed, we were managing the soil surface. And it's the soil surface that is the key. That trampling then germinated the viable soil seed bank. So we didn't add seed. We do not see seed as, a, as the biggest problem. We see management to germinate the seed bank as the problem. Wherever we go, coals all came back without adding seed. So it was in the environment. I've been, and I, no, ecology is not good enough, but I, I think some of these Australian native grasses are naturalised. Yeah, I think they're endemic in the system. Yeah, they just are, aren't they? So when um, when the DPI, yes, I had all the pasture scientists come to our place, and they go, Graham, where did the seed come from? Almost like, you know, get, getting stressed about it. All I said was, if I grow thistles, you do not ask me where the seed comes from. Why do you want to know? And they thought, oh, he doesn't understand the question. <laughs> yeah, like so, but we're used to management that drives us down that way, degrading, what we need to do is learn management that drives us up that way. How can we do that? How can we do that? We know that the feet actually promote the germination of the perennial grasses. If it's also got litter on it, it actually favours, if anything annual germinates, it doesn't get the right light and moisture conditions, so it doesn't go any further. So we need to know about this sort of thing. How can we do this? I think this is grazing 101, but not everyone agrees with me. I thought, oh, I've got to put a South Australian one in. I worked for uh, John Wormsley, who everyone would know in South Australia. No one in Victoria, New South Wales, Tasmania, or anywhere else knows, but if you say it in South Australia. So I, I worked, this is out at Yukamara, and also did Warra Wong out, up there, and did some over in uh, New Geelong at uh, a Little River. Um, and he, when, uh, when I came back from Little, Little River, Pru and one of the board members, and that said, it's a pity we don't have native grasses here. And I thought they were making fun of me. Because like, I thought it was a joke that I hadn't got, because there was native grasses everywhere. They just hadn't seen them, yeah, which I thought was pretty funny. But this is uh, where they used to test the fence out at uh, Yukamara, right up the back of the place, because um, John was very, um, very, practical, very practical, but not always very RSPCA, I say. Is that, and within this area, so all the people working, there was a lot of environmentalists, they thought this wards, weed and bare ground was natural with the bush. In that area, it had all the better salt bushes, all the better perennial grasses, all the summer ones, those warm grasses that we're talking about, they were all in there and it was managed with um, kangaroo grazing. It was open the gate for a month once a year and the kangaroos would come in and graze it and that was the difference. It was like day and night. So you, everyone know where that is? I, I can't remember. Warra, uh, Yukamara? It's in from Swan, Swan Reach? Yeah. So it's, it's not a very gentle environment. 
<laughs> yeah, like so. And it was solid perennial grass just from kangaroo grazing. But timing, timing and then cycling. This is out at Coba. I said to the guy, we will find a perennial grass on your place. And God, it nearly killed me. But this was behind a, a hinged goat gate for a goat trap. And uh, that was protected. That it was forming soil, had perennial grass in it, and it was cool and moist. So the rest of the place, you know, you, you could dive your fingers in here, you would have broken them, putting them into the rest of the 40,000 hectares. So um, this is what I'm sort of saying to people about not taking advice. I believe we need to put in little practice areas to work this out because it's different combinations of animal impact and recovery that we need to sort out. So on our land, so you know, normally they go, oh, Graham, that might work down on those good soils down at Hamilton. And then I was over at Lee and Gather and the agent goes, well, that might work in those crap soils at Hamilton. I've never heard them called the crap soils. But this is just a little corner we'd fenced off. Some Winona Warrigo got escaped somehow on our place. It was a Paspolidium from New South Wales. It must have blown in, I think. But um, all we did was put a tape across here to so I could do that. And then I have these little practice areas and I practice sort of those things. So this is in, uh, where is that? In August this year, so mid-August, that was on the outside where we just grazed nine days ago. This was where it was with the longer recoveries. And this is what it looked like underneath. This is what, so the oxidizing litter. So it's actually um, needs a graze sort of you don't want that grey litter in there but the soil surface was you know colonized by life and things like that so it was going really well colonized stood in it on saturday or sunday and it's got more species it's got massive biomass so you just need to work out what what's those combinations so you need different recoveries and probably some combinations of animal impact we go for high as an initial one. So we go for a minimum of 5,000 DSC a hectare. So sort of like yard density um, of that. So, um, or higher, somewhere there. So this is uh, in the Ararat Hills, Maryam McKenzie. This is a site that I'd set up uh, 10 years ago. And I go, is it still there? And I go, have you grazed it? No. You know, but she did the first one and we did it again sort of a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago. So she just put the sheep in. She could not believe that it, they could actually knock it on the ground. But at that stock density, it's a, they're a very powerful tool. <laughs> it's like an Eddie Maguire joke, but I'll, I'll leave the powerful tool. The, um, they're like a really powerful chainsaw. Using animals at ultra high stock density, you'll either cut your leg off or sculpt something beautiful. Most people, and I, do, when I, I run a horse course, and I go, most people use horses in the cut the leg off mode. They're not actually using them to regenerate. Horses, horses, sh horses and sheep, that's really disturbing. Horses and sheep um, uh, actually pick up litter and we're trying to leave the litter, so we've got to manage them better. It's not that the horses and sheep are bad, it's us. We have found the enemy and the enemy is us. So I always say a couple of areas with a range of recoveries and you know, sort of you know, maybe have some at different stock densities and stuff so that you can start to tease this out. Develop your own intuitive expertise, but short circuit the time from early 90s through to now is what I'm trying to get people to do. It takes a lot of effort to make sense of this complexity. If you don't have these areas and you're not sure whether it regenerated because of the season or whatever, and then we also do, yeah, we were talking about compost and compost teas and things like that. I've done a lot of this on our areas and we halve them and put it on one side and not on the other, and then say, well, this is the lowest risk, lowest cost thing is just to do the grazing. Is it worthwhile doing it? And I go and get your own evidence, but do it as a, a little practice area. Don't just go holus bolus over the whole property. Just halve one of your practice areas and put something out and see if it's worthwhile. Because we find a lot of the time, and a lot of the people we work with, they go, uh, yeah, it was slightly quicker, but really relative to the amount of work and the amount of money, I'm not going to do any more of that one. 
So that's what, with grazing, um, we find that. Uh, enterprise design is crucial. I'm saying to people, if you're not going to design your enterprise before you start some grazing management, I would not start. The benefits are very high for good grazing management, but the barriers are even higher. Incredibly high barriers. Most people are carving and lambing at the wrong time. Most people have animals that actually don't like sort of being that close together uh, and running on fully recovered grass, which is lower in protein and energy and higher in fibre. If you're not going to breed and select animals for that, I'm, I'm saying it's probably going to be difficult to make this work. Is that understandable? We need to change more than the recovery and our management and things like that. Animals will pop out of these systems. People like Michael and Anna Coughlin up at Holbrook and that 2,000 Hereford cows in one mob, um, or two and a half out at Hol uh, Marunda near Narandra and sort of 2,000 near Holbrook. And they don't buy anymore because they find that they eventually fall out. So if they don't buy females, heifers anymore, because they, they breed them up and they run adjustment while they're breeding up. So, um, and their cost of production is so low, they make money all the time, a bit like what Cole was trying to say. So we've had to go back to autumn. So we were autumn calving, then we went to spring calving because I'm a big believer before I make a comment about something, I actually need to do it. So I went spring calving. And then, uh, you know, by the time they get to Feb in our environment, that Mediterranean climate sort of thing, it's not milking feed, and you just had to wean the calves and feed them. So I'd say to all the local guys that recommended spring calving, I'd go, oh, I thought I bought the cow to be mum. Now I've got to be mum. And that didn't work. So then I said, oh, I want to be down the beach. And they just thought I was lazy. And I just couldn't get through that this doesn't make sense sort of weaning and feeding and stuff. It makes perfect sense to carve in spring in my mind, up where Cole and, and Christine come from. But we're carving now, so and our son's been home, 23-year-old. He goes, oh, for crying out loud, we just can't relax because um, oh, he's been managing the place for a year. And he's saying, yeah, so in autumn, you're trying to grow grass for the winter. In spring, you're trying to grow grass for the summer. Yeah, like it's like, he goes, when do you stop worrying? And it sort of worried him a lot. And I just said, well, you've just got to learn to be on your toes. So it is different. We monitor the animals, so we put them into the grass when the grass has got, looks like an ungrazed plant and it's got fresh litter in it. And we take them out on gut fills and dung scores. So I, I, I got this off the De Laval, um sort of uh, website and there's some out of Africa and things like that. So I've just borrowed some of this stuff. Um, it's published on the web and things, but I can send it to anyone that wants it. And we just give them a score. We're trying to shift them when th yeah, about 10% of them are just starting to tr sh show the triangle on the left-hand side. So we're in front of the hip and behind the ribs. Yeah, James? Is that you're moving them when they're filling up or when they're... No. When you're yeah, when they, so they've gone in, they've filled up, and then as they start to chew down through the pasture, we shift them when they're starting to show gut fill through. Because I've found that get, that gets you high utilisation. I work with some people that have very, very fat cows and very, very poor grass, and it gets them to work the cows a little bit harder. But also I work with people that push it that hard that the cows, cows won't get back in calf. So if you monitor that gut, Phil, it's a leading indicator of body condition score. So we're not looking early enough down the track all the time. I'm actually doing it and I hesitated. I'm trying to convince the group that I'm working with around Hamilton that they need to reduce or adjust their stocking rate at the start of the spring. Because of where we live, the Indian Ocean Dipole influences that seasonal forecast very strongly in July, and it's the most accurate figure. But it's only 65% accuracy uh, from, the, from the Bureau, and this year it was, wasn't accurate at all. So, um, but that's what you get with 65% accuracy. But I go to them, would you bet against that at the casino? Because if we reduce our stocking rate in front of the spring so that we make sure that we grow enough grass to get through the summer, we always win. There's no downside. Either the lamb gets a benefit or our bank balance gets a benefit. Grazing fails when we run out of grass and someone wants to buy them for nothing or buy or sell us feed for a lot. 
So, uh, so we do that sort of thing. So we do gut full and dung scores. Uh, I've got dung scores on the next one. Um, oh, I can go to that. This is the sheep. So I was going through a bit of a my kitchen rules sort of thing. So this was pea soup and yeah, you know, yeah, you know, like I have all in the cow one. It's biscuits and stuff. Yeah, you know, if the grass is too young, you get loose dung because you've got too much non-protein nitrogen in the feed. This is this is one of these things I did last week and they just couldn't get me at all. I said, if you want to kill your calves with scows, this is how you do it. And you could see them go. <laughs> really good. So you give them really young grass, which has got excess non-protein nitrogen in that comes across the rumen wall and goes into the bloodstream as blood urea nitrogen. Then that goes through the system and goes into the milk. Then goes into the calf, which lowers the it changes the pH of the rumen in the calf, which creates the conditions for the E. coli to grow, which lowers the immunity, and then they die of pneumonia. Is usually that we're going to die of something. So, you know, but pneumonia is usually what they they don't die of the dehydration. We usually get a few of them and stuff. It's actually the pneumonia that kills them. And I go, if you don't want to kill your calves with scours, go all the way back up here and don't give them that young grass that scours the guts out of them. I've got a friend that raises uh, dairy bulls near us. He's a really big farmer, but he, you know, we used to muck around at the pub together when we were in our early 20s and stuff. And he said, if you're so clever, come and tell me what's wrong on my place. And I go, well, any tips? No. So I get there, and we could just see the Frisian bulls over in the thing. So I dropped down on one knee and started rubbing the ground and humming. <laughs> yeah? Trying to roll my eyes, yeah? get in touch and like he's you know, he knows me so he's going what is he doing now and I said I detect a mineral deficiency <laughs> and he goes what because he knew I was mucking around but how did I do that I said they're scaring the guts out of them because they were black and white so I could see it from a kilometre away that they had really low dung scores they cannot keep nutrients in them we can't yeah, so there's no mystery here how we're killing things and stuff. So gut fills and dung scores, so we're trying to get those dung scores to be nice, like a nice group of pallets, a nice pie with a dip in the middle. And if, if it, I was at a woman's place, she's got 500 cows near um, Hawksdale, um, and as soon as I got there, I looked low dung scores, I immediately looked for scours, no scours in the calf, relax a bit, what are we going to do? Because otherwise, I was going to, yeah, like that's when you get them out of there or you have to go and feed them hay. We, when I worked for the MLA on the beef grading, what we found was if they got low, got diarrhea and low dung scores, they're actually, their bodies are working incredibly hard to get rid of all this ammonia and it blocks up the filters. That's a good one. The Y chromosome carriers understand blocking up filters. The, um, so what they do then is they'll grow really fast for a little while and then they'll stop. So most of the feedlot cattle, when I was down at the abattoirs at the thing, the grain feds were dying, the livers were falling out of them. So we need to know about these sort of relationships between young grass, dung scores, gut fills. If we do that, we don't get sick animals. But you have to be on your toes and it's stressful and it's not easy. But we can do it and there's no reason to, to, uh, to be a problem. So, um, and then the contentment score um, was just stuff I developed from Temple Grandin's work. So what I found was I can get I can get sort of people come and want to train. They you know they want to do the tree changer and they'll come. I'll say we'll come down. You can stay and I, I'm going away to work. You can run the place. Oh, George, didn't mean that. Yeah, what about you? <laughs> like, but within two days I can train them so I can go away for a week because I only get them to look at the things I want them to look at. And then they've got to fill out a form on gut fill, dung score, contentment score. And when I ring up, we've got a language to discuss. So I've taught them and I know what they're, you know, are they going to go high or low and stuff. And I allow for that. And if they get the gut fills right, they get the dung scores right, they're contented. But I found that it was very uh, hard for people new to agriculture to know whether they're content or not. I go, are they happy? Oh, I don't know. 
you know, so I've given them a contentment score. How many are chewing their cud? How many are sitting down? How many are yelling? You know, Temple Grandin, when she's uh, doing those McDonald's audits for the abattoirs and things like that, if they're vocalising, there's a problem. But so, yeah, so just using that. And then a drinking score. The, the, the woman doesn't work properly unless it's full of water. They should walk up, sheep and cattle should walk up to the trough and drink it like we drink rainwater versus town water. If they come and sniff it and carry on and looking for where the air is, or with sheep, I see this a lot on a lot of sheep places with quite dirty water, they'll walk up to the trough with purpose, sniff it and walk away. You've got a serious drinking problem. Well, I've got a serious drinking problem. They're not drinking. The, I mean, what we're trying to do is make sure that there's enough moisture in it to run, because this gut fills and dung scores relies on the, a good water and plenty to drink. So we just need to make sure we're doing that properly. And if you're doing that properly, it all works. But otherwise, and you so uh, just to reha recover that sort of in a summary, what we're trying to do is use the little practice areas to determine what's the grazing and animal impact on our, and on our farm, on our environment with our different aspects and things like that. And then we've got the seasons moving. Yeah, I worked for ICI as an industrial chemist. If we weren't going to make our profit, we put the price up. And we used to stress about what we were going to write in the letter. You know, last time we used the oil price, what are we going to use this time? I go, I know a lot of farmers that get over that pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, we thought we were managing. So there's a lot of these things that we need to do. We need to have simple plans. If it feels like you don't know enough in this area, it's usually because it's not simple enough. And so I do simple plans with people, train them on these, put them in on um, perennial grass recovery, take them out on gut fills and dung scores, and it works pretty simply. It's not the best, it's not perfect, but it'll work in practice, and I'd be suggesting we had a go at that. There's some quite a few negatives of this, what I'm talking about, so moving animals on gut fill. But if I stick on the negatives, you get slower perennial grass recovery. And this has been really researched well by Franklin uh, Kreider. If you take more leaf area off, you slough off more roots, roots and it takes longer to recover. I'm saying we need that to maintain um, our good perennial grasses. When we don't do that, we actually end up with fog grass and other weeds and stuff. I think it requires low energy cows and sheep. They need to be selected for. I used to have a bit that you know, doesn't really matter. Yeah, you know, when we were training grazing, we do that, you know, like the animals are just animals sort of thing. You yeah, go out and buy some more. It's not true, I don't think. You know, someone else, he goes, you trained me in the 90s and you're not saying anything like you said then. I go, yeah, what do you got to be afraid of? What am I going to be saying in five years? But so we've gone back to sort of saying that it probably suits a breeding focus unless you can get trading animals out of someone that's breeding animals with low cow energy values or, or low uh, ewe energy values. The cow energy value in the Angus herd in the States has gone from plus 100 uh, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s to minus 40. So it's rapidly reduced and it's based on how much milk and how much frame. At the same time that the feedlot value has gone almost directly the opposite. So the wealth has been transferred from the Angus people in um, the US and, um, and transferred to the feedlotters by selecting for them. And if you select for average daily gain, you end up selecting for muscle and not fat. And fat's what helps um, uh, the, the cows and sheep cycle. You know what people say to me, how are we going to feed the nine billion? I go, I, th I think of this as a non-problem. As far as I know, mammals stop breeding when they don't get fed. So I think it's sort of one of those. So we need to, yeah. So with the positives, lower rainfall risk, increasing profit, quickly increases landscape function. We've got research all over the shop on this. Increases your uh, functional availability of nutrients. I think of it as functional availability and absolute availability. So have you got a functional deficiency or an absolute deficiency? And you get an increase in the better grasses. I'm trying to develop this idea, and it comes from Dave Snowden. And he, he goes that 
if, it all, if the Marines in the US, if everything goes, falls apart, they have like a, a um, I can't even say hero, heuristic, a, a rule of thumb, so that's why I've gone for a rule of thumb, where they go, take the high ground. So if it all, you know, you lose all um, structure and you don't know who's in charge, the rules of thumb is take the high ground, keep moving, and like, yeah, so they just have these things that you actually know to, what to do. And when, it, when the grazing's going wrong, this is what I do. I reduce stocking rate, increase recovery, and increase stock density. The way we have our paddocks set up, we have them in lanes and we cross strip with temporary fence and we just can lower that or increase that. So we can always increase and decrease stock density. So I've been thinking that's, you know, when in doubt, this is what we do. But um, it's sort of one of those ideas that I'm not sure it works for people. I'm still working on it. Work in progress.